the European Union strategy for the Danube region addresses common challenges, combining efforts and facilitating cooperation. The strategy is connecting people to improve the quality of life through sustainable development in the Danube region, creating a region where life loves to live. Good evening and a warm welcome from the Danube University Krems. My name is Sebastian Schäfer. I'm the managing director of the Institute for the Danube region and Central Europe. Welcome to this Danube Salon in the framework of the Europa Forum Wachau. It's a pleasure to be looking into real faces for the first time since a very, very long time. But we are also, of course, welcoming everyone who is watching us through a screen. The promotion of cross-border and transnational cooperation is the Danu in the Danube region is one of the pillars of the EU SDR. And after 10 years of this macro-regional strategy, focusing on the most international and most diverse river in the world, this salon represents a presentation of crucial elements of co-shaping the European future. Regional cooperation, science, youth, and education. And we have a very wonderful panel to discuss exactly these topics today. And I would like to welcome First and foremost, of course, the president of the Europa Forum Wachau, Martin Eichtinger, Minister of Housing, Labour and International Relations in the Government of Lower Austria. <laughs> then, of course, our host, the rector of the Danube University, Krems, Friedrich Faulhammer. and one of our most important cooperation partners for this event, the Secretary General of the Working Community of the Danube Regions, Age Donauländer, Simon Ortner. We have fantastic guests planned in two rounds of interviews and also a panel discussion. And um, I would like to welcome very much Vidozava Enderich, Assistant Provincial Secretary for Regional Development, Inter-Regional Cooperation and Local Self-Government of the Autonomous um, Province of Vojvodina in Serbia. And also <laughs> Presidency of the Agedonale. <laughs> the province currently holds the presidency of the Agedona Lenders, so we are very happy to have you with us. And then, of course, also, um, not only because he is vice chairman of the board of the IDM, but also because he is the former coordinator of the EU strategy for the Danube region and the former deputy mayor of the city of Vienna, Rudolf Schicker. Also with us is Harald Stranzel, National Coordinator for the EU Strategy for the Danube Region in the Federal Ministry for European and International Affairs. <laughs> the Romanian National Coordinator of the Danube Strategy, Stefan Raswan Raab, is also here with us. From the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, Unifprof Verena Vinivata, who is also a project coordinator for Danube Future and a member of the board of IDM. <laughs> Rektor Sravko Kacic, he is uh, the current president of the Danube Rectors Conference, DRC, and also the rector of the University of Maribor. Also with us is Katka Krejcová, International Relations in the Department of Art and Culture in the Office of the Lower Austrian Government. <laughs> and last but not least, we have the coordinator of the Danube Strategy Point in Vienna with us, Robert Lichtner. Welcome. <laughs> but of course, I also welcome very much our viewers at home 
or wherever you are watching this live stream. We want to make this as interactive as possible. And therefore, when you have followed the Europa Forum Wachau in uh, the last uh, couple of hours and days, then you already know um, also from the um, other Europa Forum Wachau salons, Mentimeter, who is a possibility to interactively participate, ask your questions, and also give us some insights in what you think. You can participate by going to menti.com and then use the code 36841405 or you just unlock your smartphone, put it on the invitation that you have received and connect via this or you can also scan the QR code. And to start it off, we will ask the first question. Open answers. What would you say is the characteristic of the Danube region? And we will wait here a little bit until the answers also arrive from you at home because there is a slight delay in the live stream. The first answers are already arriving. Diversity, Vielfalt also in German, nature, connectivity, common history, traffic, something I have experienced for the first time in a long time today when I drove with the car to Krems, nature, openness, give it a little bit more time. We can see there's a lot of characteristics in this diverse river. And uh, this is the perfect basis, I would say, for the first round of interviews. And for this, I would like to welcome to the stage Martin Eichtinger, Widosawa Enderic, and, Rudolf, and Rudolf Schicker. Thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, my first question would be to uh, um, President Eichtinger. Lower Austria has already been very active in the Danube region, not only with the working community of the Danube regions, which actually was started long before the USDR came into being. Can you tell us more about the importance of regions, um, also in the European multi-level governance, and especially the role of Lower Austria? Well, good evening, everybody, um, here in this room. It's wonderful to see the physical presence of all of you, uh, but also uh, a warm welcome to the viewers uh, online. Uh, it's wonderful to be here to celebrate the 10 years of the EU strategy for the Danube region. Why is the Danube for Lower Austria so important, and why do we pay so much attention to the international cooperation in the Danube region? Well, you must understand Lower Austria for many, many years was really at the dead end of the Western, uh, um, of, uh, Western Europe. Um, we had one, uh, or we had one of the longest uh, border with the Iron Curtain at the time with uh, Czechoslovakia. And um, uh, people really had the feeling that this is where Europe stops. We had the barbed wire at the border. We had uh, very unpleasant experiences, unfortunately, also very many victims at the, at the Iron Curtain. Uh, so once the Iron Curtain fell, there was this uh, very strong feeling that now we need to go out and have a very intensive international cooperation. But you are right that Lower Austria started to work on the working community of Danube regions already prior to the fall of the Iron Curtain which I think was quite a brave step at the time because the first talk started already in 1982 and in 1990, a year after the fall of the Iron Curtain, the document, the founding document um, of the uh, community, um, of the working community of Danube regions was signed um, very fittingly on a ship outside of Dürnstein. Uh, I was happy to pr be present at the time. It was really a very wonderful moment. And then of course, 
this uh, cooperation evolved and uh, over the years uh, it was taken to a very high level because all the regions along the Danube, which after all is a very strong unifying force in Europe. Uh, the Danube is, does not only have this long history, um, there are so many cultural connections, um, but over the years the regions really uh, evolved and, and uh, became more mature and they had a, had a great also economic development. And uh, we were uh, also very pleased uh, when in 2011, the governments of Romania and Austria really triggered the idea of uh, a U European Union strategy for the Danube region. And uh, ever since, you know, Austria has been very strongly supporting uh, this uh, strategy and Lower Austria has benefited a lot from it. In the working community uh, of Danube regions, we are very delighted to have Vojvodina as our current chair. And in the Danube strategy, I think it will be interesting to see because next year Ukraine will be in the chair and we uh, expect that there will be lots of impulses and uh, new ideas coming from Ukraine as well. I think what is important about this cooperation in the Danube region is that we face so many great challenges. Um, we saw some of them in the introductory movie. I think first and foremost it's the ecological question, the question of environmental protection, but it's also a question of how are we going to, um, uh, to um, uh, after the pandemic, to relaunch our economies. There are the questions of digitalization, which happened during uh, the, uh, the pandemic, that we more and more relied on digital conversations and uh, home office and work from home. Uh, all those issues are easier if you uh, tackle them in a good cooperation with your neighbors and we are very much looking forward to taking this even further. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Vidozava Enderich, we have heard that the autonomous province of Vojvodina has the chairmanship of the working communities of the Danube regions and uh, what synergies do actually exist between the regional and macro-regional corporations when you look at the role of an autonomous province within this framework. Uh, thank you for the question. First of all, I would like to uh, greet uh, uh, all the participants. Uh, first of all, uh, esteemed uh, Mr. Eitinger. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to, uh, to esteem uh, and uh, to extend the greets from Mr. Uh, uh, president Igor Mirovic, President of, of the uh, Autonomous Province of Vojvodina, and uh, also our uh, se uh, Provincial Secretary, Mr. Alexander Sofic, uh, the Secretary for the Regional Development, uh, Interregional Cooperation, and um, Self Government. And that I'm very happy that I had to have opportunity to participate in this uh, uh, Europa Forum uh, in Wachau. And I would like also to <laughs> congratulate you on the 25th uh, anniversary of the uh, Europa Forum Wachau. Um, when we are talking about uh, uh, Autonomous Province of Vojvodina, uh, we, uh, as you already said, uh, we hold the presidency uh, for this and next year, 2021 and 2022. And um, under that stage, uh, uh, I can uh, say that uh, many events and manifestations will be organized uh, uh, under our presidency. And uh, thankful to um, Mr. President, uh, esteemed uh, President Mikhail. Leitner and uh, President Igor Mirovic, uh, who uh, defines and uh, agreed about the priorities uh, of our presidency, which are uh, digitalization, culture and uh, transportation. Uh, so uh, I think uh, those priorities are also the priorities of the uh, whole uh, Danube regions, or the all uh, regions in uh, Danube Basin. Uh, so. Uh, uh, we are very grateful to have opportunity to coordinate and uh, uh, to connect, uh, m make more connections, uh, cooperate with the institutions and uh, uh, many um, uh, at the local level, regional level, uh, uh, with uh, all partners. 
So um, if we uh, mention uh, regional uh, and uh, macro-regional strategies, um, uh, I, I should say that uh, Vojvodina and uh, other regions that are not um, candidate countries and they are not still in the uh, European Union, uh, they see that uh, through the financial uh, resources and the funds uh, which uh, can uh, 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 which can uh, get and uh, uh, access and uh, uh, this is very important uh, that we have opportunity uh, to participate in many uh, funds in many um, programs uh, that are available uh, such as uh, uh, as you uh, have said, uh, uh, cross-border cooperation and uh, Danube transnational programs. And for example, uh, for the last period, last seven years, uh, we had a, a successful period for a, a, a Danube transnational program. Uh, we um, uh, implemented uh, about 27 million euros uh, uh, of the projects and uh, uh, of which about 3 million euros were implemented in Vojvodina. Uh, I can say uh, uh, that this, this is very important because uh, we can cooperate and connect with the partners uh, to exchange uh, uh, many uh, best practices uh, uh, to make standards uh, more uh, at higher level and uh, what is very important when we are talking about integration process. Thank you very much. Rudolf Schicker, since 2020, the Agedonauländer Infopoint is uh, established at the Institute for the Danube Region in Central Europe to further strengthen the activities in the region, but also to create further synergies. The Permanent Secretariat of the Danube Practice Conference is also located at IDM. All three institutions have been involved in the conceptualization of this event. And as Vice Chairman of IDM, could you tell us more about the role of the Institute, which has been fostering European perspectives and regional action, actions since 1953, and the importance of such cooperations in the Danube region? Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, out from my position as pensioner, uh, retired person, uh, so um, it's, it's nice to be on stage again. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, Europa Forum Wachau uh, to organize this uh, wonderful meeting. Um, yeah, getting back to a very interesting question uh, put to one of the vice uh, presidents uh, by the managing director. <laughs> so <laughs> I should, would be rather in a better position to answer this question, but I'll try my best. Uh, you already mentioned in uh, 53, 1953, this uh, organization was uh, founded. And uh, looking back to this period um, uh, of the 50s of last century, uh, we have to say that it was rather different to nowadays. We had uh, Tito's Yugoslavia uh, uh, in the 50s and 60s. We had the revolutions in Hungary, in uh, Poland, in the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakian Republic um, uh, against uh, Soviet communism. And uh, of course, it was a very difficult way uh, to establish Western democracy, to establish cap a capitalistic economic system in these countries. And uh, IDM, and especially the president of IDM, Mr. Busek, uh, were uh, heavily supporting this process, bringing together all the stakeholders on uh, the scientific level, on the political level, on the, on the actors on the political field, uh, from the regions, uh, from the nations, and from states which were founded out of other states like not mentioning Yugoslavia, but uh, uh, Slovakia and, and, and the Czech Republic, for instance, or Moldavia, and bringing together all these uh, people involved in uh, developing um, their own country, in having conflicts with their neighbors, but seeing the common sense of a uh, greater Europe, that's what uh, Mr. Busig and the IDM uh, could present during the last uh, 50, yeah, more than 50 years. So um, I think the IDM is one of the uh, most uh, interesting organizations because there's little money, there are big ideas, and great chances. And I think Nowadays, we are back in a situation where there are great chances and, and great difficulties to solve. 
Um, the liberal democracy was established in almost all of these countries alongside the Danube. Out, 18 of, out, out of the 18 countries in the Danube Basin are uh, within the uh, uh, ISDR. Uh, so, um, but still we have to see that during the last years, uh, there was a slight move from liberal democracy towards illiberal democracy. Uh, it was not clear that multilateralism is important and brings back more freedom for each, each, each of the nations. They have to cooperate, even, uh, especially as small countries. And that's something where the IDM nowadays has to be and is very busy. And I think that's a good uh, role for this institution to again come back to what was uh, at the beginning. Uh, to uh, establish liberal democracy, to establish constitutional democracies in our greater Europe. Thank you very much. President Eichinger, you have mentioned the unique composition of the EUSDR. We have EU member countries, we have candidate countries, but we also have Eastern Partnership target countries. Given with all your experience in bringing the Central and Eastern European countries closer to the European Union, all these changes that Rudolf Schicker mentioned, you have experienced firsthand and also helped fostering this. Um, can you give us a little bit more insight of how macro-regional strategies facilitate approximation to the European Union? First of all, let me say that um, I'm a great admirer of IDM and uh, even more so of Mr. Schicker because he's really, one could say, the institutional memory uh, of uh, politics in the, in the Danube region. Um, uh, the EUSDR uh, was an interesting project from the outset because we have, if I'm not mistaken, among the 14 countries, nine EU member states. Uh, we have now two candidate countries, uh, Serbia and Montenegro. Uh, Serbia being very promising as a, um, uh, as a new member of the European Union. Uh, and of course we have uh, um, uh, the Ukraine and Moldova. And uh, it's uh, an interesting mix. But I think what uh, is true for all the countries is that the European Union programs that deal with the Danube region, but not only if you look to science, uh, scientific programs, if you look to uh, exchange programs, there are so many programs where countries which are in the course of getting closer to the European Union to become once a member of the European Union, be it or not, uh, for, for some of them there is the, the imminent uh, um, procedure and the, the membership negotiations. Um, it's a, um, it's a, a, a testing ground where they can look at their own institutions, how do we do in the cooperation in European Union programs. Um, it's a, a tool. Uh, to get closer to the European Union, to have the experience of cross-border cooperation with European Union members. And that way you can be in many programs participating, cooperating, uh, without already being an EU member. So it is, an, it is a great advantage for the countries, I think, and it's a great advantage for us, because this is our immediate neighborhood. We have close contacts, we have an excellent cooperation, and this is something where we get closer and where we can, uh, as I said at the outset, where we can tackle the big challenges that lie ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Vidosava Enderic, from the perspective of a candidate country, a very promising candidate country, um, but nevertheless uh, still outside of the European Union, how do you perceive this possibility of uh, fostering approximation within the USDR? Um. I can say that the uh, uh, Republic of Serbia, uh, uh, the main goal is uh, Europe Union path, that's uh, no, no question. But uh, uh, many, uh, many chapters, as you know, are still closed. Uh, we, have, uh, we are facing uh, many challenges on the different levels, um, especially uh, the, the South, the, uh, South uh, Serbia, uh, I can say the Vojvodina is the most developed region in uh, Serbia and is not uh, uh, comparing uh, to other regions, to other regions in Serbia. Uh, so um, 
uh, I can say uh, that uh, we have the most uh, connectivities and the most uh, connections uh, with uh, partners and regions in uh, all uh, regions uh, in Europe Union, but uh, especially Danube regions, and uh, we need uh, uh, that support from EU uh, of uh, funding, processes, uh, uh, know-how and everything uh, to implement uh, standards and uh, to adjust uh, legislation, uh, first of all legislation and then all standards in all um, uh, and to implement uh, standards in all chapters in, uh, that are open and non-opened. Uh, so. Uh, I, I don't have predictions um, about uh, the integration of uh, Serbia, uh, but uh, I think the most important is this process and uh, developing, enhance, enhancing in, uh, in all segments uh, is the most important and uh, that this uh, disparity between regions, uh, the, the main aim is to be the, uh, uh, at the lowest level. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, that we have to continue to uh, communicate, to uh, make um, joint uh, initiatives about uh, all segments and uh, uh, according to this we can uh, plan or uh, we can uh, see the future of Serbia in a European Union, as we feel. <laughs> Thank you very much. If, if, if you permit, I would just like to add something because this morning we had um, a, a great panel discussion with our foreign minister on the, on the question of uh, EU enlargement to the Western Balkans. And I think what you just said, there was one very interesting proposal by our foreign minister, Alexander Schallenberg. He said, we should really make it possible in the European Union that the countries of the Western Balkans become full members of the most important programs that we also offer to other countries. Uh, for example, the scientific program uh, uh, Euro, uh, Euro, uh, Horizon Europe mm -hmm. or the exchange program Erasmus+. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be a good idea to show to our Western Balkan friends that we really mean it seriously and that we really want to have them in by allowing them to join those mm -hmm. programs even before becoming a member of the European yeah. Union. Yeah. Getting politically engaged even if not with a complete integration um, is certainly something that will also help. Regions can contribute to that, um, as we have learned now. So, um, thank you very much. Let's talk a little bit more about the governance of the EUSDR. And uh, there we have um, the perfect person standing here on stage with us. Um, you have been very active yourself, first in the PA10 for the city of Vienna, and then later at the Danube strategy point that we will have a closer look in our panel discussion with uh, Robert Lichtner later on. Can you tell us a little bit more about how priority areas shape the governance of the USDR and why Vienna has been so active? Well, first of all, let me say that um, I uh, very much appreciate any activities of Austria and especially of the European Union to make clear to all countries in the Western Balkan that they are part of our Europe and not of Europe uh, further east. So they are part of our Europe and also North Macedonia and uh, the Kosovo <coughs> are part of this Europe and they were part, so they have to come back and we have to do everything to get them back again. So why is the city of Vienna engaged in such a uh, uh, important uh, uh, position like uh, uh, leading the, uh, the Danube strategy point? Well, actually, looking back to 2008, when Romania and Austria uh, introduced the idea of this macro-regional strategy uh, on the European Council, uh, the city of Vienna could see how fascinating this idea is to bring together within one macro region the wealthiest countries of the European Union, like Germany and Austria, and the ones uh, lagging behind, uh, like uh, in those days Bulgaria. I'm afraid it's still uh, on this side, and others which never will become uh, members of the European Union, like uh, uh, Moldova or, uh, uh, or the Ukraine. So um, having them together with all the differences, with all the diversity, um, with uh, experience in capitalism, capitalism uh, with experience in uh, state communism, with experience uh, in uh, liberal democracy, 
uh, this uh, experience in one-party systems. Bringing them together is one of the most important uh, and fascinating ideas. And um, as far as I, uh, as, as I can remember those days in Vienna, we started to work together with Lower Austria um, as the two regions uh, involved in the process uh, from the Austrian side. And we could bring all the ideas of the Arge Donauländer, well, Vienna also is part uh, of, and um, we had the opportunity to make clear that cooperation of 14 nations, of 14 states, is very important by means of, your, of, of uh, influencing the European Union. But on the other hand, you've got the regions, you've got the cities, and they are the places where people live. And that's the places where they get together, where they shape the mindset of a country. So what we wanted to do together with Lower Austria is to bring in uh, the ideas of regions and, and local authorities. And that worked pretty well. So when uh, uh, the uh, European Council um, endorsed uh, the first action plan in 2011, we rather were a bit annoyed uh, of the three no's. No new funding, no new institution, no new regulation. So how should something like that uh, get into practice? So it was not so complicated as it looked, because the next step of the European side was to establish the transnational program for the Danube region. So there was a certain amount of money uh, for cooperation, not for having uh, built new big infrastructures, but for cooperation. And looking at what is missing most is um, to have a very close exchange of governance. And um, not, not since yesterday, not uh, on first place, but on the, on the twelfth place, but uh, until yesterday on the first place of the most livable cities on the world, uh, Vienna had the idea to bring uh, our uh, results uh, to all the other cities in the region. And the other cities were looking to Vienna. I, I know Vojvodina uh, and your capital were, were, were very often in, in the city of Vienna with very close corporations, also with Beograd and uh, Budapest and, uh, and, and, and Sofia and Bucharest. Uh, and so we decided to uh, come in for uh, hosting uh, the priority area 10, uh, where uh, the local authorities, local governance is one of the parts. And between so the first step was done. Funding was here and cooperation was here. Next step was to look how can we convince uh, the European side to have a uh, institutional background. And um, with the help of our experience in Austria, with the Österreichische uh, Raumordnungskonferenz, uh, Austrian Conference for Regional uh, Development, um, uh, it's a body also with no uh, legislative background, but it is a very close cooperation, collaboration between ministries, the regions and cities and communities. Uh, so, um, and social partners as well. So that was one of the ideas we had in Vienna. If you establish a uh, Danube strategy point, then it has to be something like the EUROC on Austrian level for the international level to be supportive to be a supportive secretariat for all 14 countries, for offering all priority areas uh, the, f uh, the, the, the platform of cooperation, platform of exchange uh, to get uh, certain professionality to one or the other projects, uh, but to, to build up a uh, platform where the exchange can take place. So in 2018, we succeeded. Uh, we end again uh, the... Uh, the, the uh, 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 this uh, Danube strategy point, I could start this process and uh, Robert Lichtner uh, is uh, continuing. Um, and nowadays we have to say that uh, all four macro regional strategies, the other three macro regional strategies are looking uh, to the Danube strategy because of this Danube uh, strategy point. So we could establish a secretariat where all gets together that is important for work on the, on the, on the Danube strategy. What is missing nowadays, 
uh, that's uh, the political ownership. I know that you, that uh, your, uh, your uh, governor uh, in, in, in Lower Austria, she was also involved in the process, in the beginning process of the TENEP strategy. Uh, we really, and, and um, our mayor in Vienna, we really want to have a political ownership for that. And we hope that the nations, that the representatives of the states, take it also. That it, they see that it's necessary not to have meetings of high-level groups and so. They're still civil servants, but you have to have the political ownership. Politicians have to involve themselves in the process of integrating the most diverse region, macro region in, Austria, in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all three of you. Um, President Eichtinger, thank you very much, of course, for uh, and congratulations for the 25th anniversary of the Europa Forum Machau. It's a pleasure to have such a broad knowledge on macro regional cooperation in the Danube region with us here. Um, thank you very much. We are looking forward um, to the future uh, further cooperation, further ownership, further integration, even beyond maybe the one or the other uh, border that. Uh, is still unfortunately there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have heard a lot about the USDR already. We have talked about the governance. We would like to know uh, from you now, among the four pillars of the USDR, which one do you think is the most important? Remember, you can go to menti.com, you can um, scan the QR code, you can put your unlocked phone on the invitation that you have received. The code is 36841405. And we have five answers prepared for you across all the four pillars represented. Or, as a fifth option, all pillars are equally important. We will wait a little bit longer, as we know that there is a slight delay in the live stream. There are participants that are virtually with us. And you can see it's a, close, it's a close call, but yeah, all four pillars are equally important but then also environmental protection and building prosperity is now taking the lead. In any case, we have uh, looked uh, a little bit back already. We have heard that the EUSDR dates back to a joint initiative between Austria and Romania, and therefore I would like to welcome to the stage Harald Stranzel and Stefan Raswan Raab. Thank you very much for being with us. Now, um, in the first round of questions, we're going to look back, and then we also are going to look into the future. So when we look back to the beginning of the USDR, um, which uh, we learned has been launched by Austria and Romania, um, and endorsed by the European Council in 2011, what were the goals of the strategy back then? First of all, uh, let me stress the fact that um, 2010, 2011, so 10 years back when the strategy was, um, was established upon the initiative of Romania and Austria, it was a completely different world, another era. Uh, the world had just recovered from a financial crisis. Um, Brexit had been avoided, nobody was talking about Brexit at the time, uh, and uh, Arab Spring was in full swing, so quite some optimism around. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, after the enlargement rounds of uh, the European Union 2004 and 2007. In total, 13 new members uh, joined the European Union, making the European Union really a strong, powerful, and large uh, community of 28 member states. Uh, 28 member states, um, counting for almost 500 million inhabitants, um, largest trading bloc in the world. 
And yet, and yet, the reunification of Europe uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain and the enlargement rounds remained an unfinished business, leaving the Western Balkan countries outside the Union and also the uh, Eastern Partnership countries, uh, so to say, at a difficult geopolitical rift. So this was the backdrop against which uh, the Danube strategy was established. Ten years ago, upon the initiative of Austria and Romania once again, creating really a large uh, macro region comprising 14 countries, uh, 115 million inhabitants, uh, counting for almost a fifth of the surface of, uh, of the Union, and making also after the enlargement uh, the Danube River, so to say, an internal, quasi-internal EU river. Uh, the goals, this was your specific question, uh, we've heard already a bit of it uh, before in the discussions, of course, bridging uh, the gaps, bringing together uh, countries uh, inside the European Union and outside them, of course, uh, boosting regional cooperation, also cohesion of those countries, uh, reinforcing integration, uh, and of course, tackling uh, common challenges of the whole region, ranging from socioeconomic disparities, demographic problems, um, inadequate uh, transport connections, um, also untapped uh, economic potential, also shipping potential of the Danube River. So all these, I think, were some goals um, uh, on the agenda of the uh, Danube strategy from the uh, very outset. And um, let me perhaps also conclude um, uh, that, uh, and this was already uh, stressed before, we are here representatives of uh, the uh, governance, uh, governments of our countries. For Austria, Danube region has always been uh, a priority, a foreign policy priority, part, so to say, of the foreign policy DNA of Austria. And, um, and this goes, of course, also for, uh, for the uh, Bundesländer, in particular, Lower Austria and uh, Vienna, which have been also involved in these uh, projects uh, from the very outset until uh, today. We've heard about it already before. And I think that's the reason why it's no coincidence at all that uh, 12 years ago at the Europa Forum at the time, uh, for the first time, this idea mm. of a Danube strategy was officially promulgated, uh, officially announced. And now, um, 12 years after, uh, we celebrate here uh, in Krems uh, again within the framework of the Europa Forum Wachau and this uh, Donau Salon, the 10th anniversary of uh, the Danube strategy. Thank you very much. Would you say from a Romanian perspective, the goals that were envisioned back then um, have been achieved after 10 years? Yes, indeed. Uh, let, let me also recall up before the uh, great cooperation our countries have had uh, at that time and which, uh, which led to the um, uh, approval of adoption of the strategy by, by the whole um, uh, union. Um, indeed, uh, I also ha want to, to, to make a, a remark. It, it wasn't said before here, but the, the public announcement about the uh, launch of the strategy was made during the Europa Forum uh, in Bajau. In, uh, in 2009, if I, if I uh, recall correctly. Um, if we look back in time, um, I think the, uh, given the, the um, uh, impact of the strategy on the uh, daily life of many citizens, given uh, the, the interest of many stakeholders to implement projects, I think the, uh, the strategy acts as, uh, as an uh, accelerator for, for the region. Moreover, uh, it has managed to, um, to bring to the same table um, stakeholders from member states and non-EU member states, which, uh, which was, uh, was very, very important. And um, by this, the strategy has enabled synergies to the uh, enlargement policy of the EU. It has facilitated uh, candidate countries to, to come closer to European values and standards. The strategy has also paid uh, a lot of attention to the EU neighborhoods policy, and by this it has enabled the um, creation of a space of uh, shared values for democracy and rule of law uh, in our uh, eastern neighborhoods. 
Thank you very much. So when we um, now talk about that 10 years have passed and uh, we want to look into the future and if our uh, hosts allow us that we will be back mm. in 10 years, what will the EU, uh, European Union strategy for the Danube region look like then? Well, not an easy one, actually. It's always uh, difficult to, to uh, predict and foresee the future, yeah. uh, even more so in our hyperspeed world uh, right now. Uh, in addition to that, I think we are experiencing um, uh, a paradigm shift in global politics. Um, uh, we've talked for decades about an ever closer and larger European Union. Now people talk more about uh, national sovereignty and national identities. Uh, impacting, of course, also uh, the international uh, cross-border cooperation. And uh, third, I think we should uh, never forget that the Daniel region is uh, located in a very sensitive geopolitical area. It's a gateway uh, to um, Central Asia, the Black Sea region, uh, to Russia, to China, to Turkey, uh, to the Middle East. Um, all these powers are seeking influence uh, in this uh, region. Uh, trying mm. to do this uh, with um, uh, very targeted um, uh, infrastructure investment projects and also nowadays uh, with vaccine diplomacy. So uh, this, I think, um, is, is uh, uh, the uh, situation we have to, to have in mind. Uh, if you talk me outlook 2030 uh, Danube strategy, then perhaps I would like to um, just... Um, put forward a kind of uh, optimistic and uh, desirable scenario. And I stress really uh, optimistic and desirable. <clears throat> uh, of course, would be uh, for uh, the Danube strategy mission accomplished if the Western Balkan countries uh, in 10 years from now would be members of the European Union and that the Eastern Partnership countries, uh, Ukraine and, and Moldova, would be close and uh, stable uh, partners of the European Union, in any case uh, oriented towards uh, Europe. Uh, I think this uh, would really mean for the Danube strategy mission accomplished. I think for the Danube strategy mission accomplished uh, would also mean that it contributes uh, to the everyday life of the citizens, improving them, uh, of course, uh, by um, um, mm. trying to, uh, to, to help them to fix uh, the, the daily uh, problems uh, they have. Uh, for that uh, very reason, uh, last year, uh, a new strategic action plan was adopted um, uh, in April 2020, comprising 85 um, planned activities around uh, 12 priority action areas, ranging from mobility over education skills uh, to infrastructure, uh, culture, uh, tourism. So quite a range of, of, of topics. Um, where I see, um, just to come, to come to an end, where I see actually the two real added value items for the Danube strategy is number one, it's really a forum to do structured knowledge transfer between and among all the countries and the regions for relevant uh, issues. Uh, I can give you just an example. I think next week there will be a stakeholder conference uh, co-organized by Austria and by Ukraine uh, on education, on digitization, uh, social inclusion. And another area where I see really a uh, big potential for the Danube strategy is people-to-people -people contact. So to say a bit apart from the official political gatherings that take place anyhow. And here again, I think Danube strategy is a, a valuable uh, forum uh, and a platform mm. to do this. And exactly for that very reason, uh, the countries of the Danube region strategy are now trying uh, to establish a kind of Danube strategy youth forum where representatives of the younger generation of all the 14 countries come together to shape together the future of this uh, region. So you can see a lot uh, has been done already and achieved, but yeah. uh, a lot is still uh, to be done in the future. In any case, I can say for Austria, we are very committed to this region. We are committed to the strategy. Perhaps in the future, there will be another choice for us uh, to take over the presidency, the rotating presidency of the Danube region. Not yet decided, but would, of course, uh, help us uh, to bear even more responsibility uh, in this region and within the strategy than now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schranz and Mr. Rapp. When we now would travel back to the, uh, in, no, to the year 2031, and we look back on the achievements that the EU SDR has been uh, the undergoing 
over the past 10 years, yeah. what would they look like? Well, I, I don't have the crystal ball, <laughs> so, uh, but um, I think I would love uh, to be able to, to state that uh, um, there have been even more concrete projects implemented uh, which directly lead to, to the benefit of, uh, of ordinary uh, people. Um, and um, to this perhaps would also uh, belong uh, a project of navigability on the uh, mine Rhine uh, Danube. I would love to, to, to be able to see a, a fleet of uh, hydrogen powered uh, uh, vessels on the Danube and, uh, and by this uh, to see the strategy contributing actually to, to, the, to creating the Danube as a, as a green corridor. Mm -hmm. I think I would also like to, 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 to see that the, um, the strategy has, um, has made uh, best use of, um, of the major EU policies in, in the pipeline nowadays, the, uh, the digital and, and, the, and the green transition. Um, of course, our aim was to create uh, an area with uh, less divergence, with more uh, convergence economically and socially, and I hope to, to be able to, to see this in, in 10 years' time. Thank you very much uh, for these predictions. Yeah, we do not have a crystal ball, but we are recording this video. So uh, if the <laughs> rector of the Danube University Krems allows us to come back in 10 years, I see him nodding. So uh, we should uh, book an appointment in, in uh, June 2031. I'd like to welcome you back on stage. We look at the things that you have said and that we have hopefully achieved by then. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Mr. Kranzler. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Thank We have looked back, we have looked into the future. Now we are looking at stakeholders in the Danube region and several projects and initiatives. And for this, we have a wonderful panel and I would like to welcome to the stage Verena Vinivata, Stravko Kacic, Katka Krejcova und, and Robert Lichtner. <laughs> Yeah, in the Mentimeter, um, the environment has been taken the lead, but then was a little bit overtaken by prosperity. Um, but nevertheless, it's a very important topic. And uh, before we dive into this with your expertise, Verena, we're going to have a quick look at a video. The Danube Basin is characterized by complex and yet fragile ecosystems and habitats underpinning all human activities. As climate changes, sustainable use of natural resources and the overall preservation of the quality of environment are main challenges for the region. Therefore, the strategy for the Danube region enables specific cooperation activities for restoring and maintaining water quality, managing environmental risks and preserving biodiversity, landscapes and the quality of air and soils. Stakeholders across the Danube region developed joint measures to protect and restore the quality of invaluable natural assets, forming a wide variety of interrelated and interdependent ecosystems. At the same time, integrated activities were designed in order to prevent, prepare for and respond to natural and man-made disasters. Yeah, Verena, sustainability is one 
not only important topic, but also something that is very dear to you. And you have, uh, within this framework, started an EUSDR flagship project, Denu Future. Can you tell us a little bit more about the goals and also the results, and maybe the state of the art? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I remember being on this stage and urging the rectors of the Danube Rectors Conference to keep funding and keep paying attention to Danube Future a few years ago. And let me start with the end. I'm very, very happy that it was possible, also via the IDM, as the Permanent Secretariat of the Danube Rectors Conference, to keep some of the flagship project alive after its pilot phase ended. We had a six-year uh, project from 2013 to 2019, and it actually started as a cooperation between two rectors conferences, the Danube Rectors Conference and the Alp Psychiatric Rectors Conference, and they wanted to do something for the EUSDR. And I was asked if I would have an idea, um, and I had an idea. And this idea was basically that, um, yes, everybody's talking about the knowledge economy, but there is more to knowledge than just economy. And environmental pollution, floods, all the kinds of challenges that sustainable development faces know no borders. And it would be young people who should be enabled to cooperate across borders, learn the interdisciplinary skills that are necessary, because every environmental problem is also a social problem. At if you don't pay attention, it's going to be an economic problem sooner or later. So there is no question that you need to have interdisciplinary skills. And we dreamed of a sustainable future for the Danube region via helping young people from all the countries to learn these skills. And in order to do that, we put together five interdisciplinary schools, Danube interdisciplinary schools. But before we could do that, we actually had to persuade a few rectors that they would actually want it, really. And that was the rectors of Novi Sad, of Trieste, um, of the Alp Alp Madre Universität Klagenfurt, end of Boku, where I'm now based. Um, and those four became the core partners of the whole thing. Um, and we chose Gorizia as the hosting place uh, via the University of Trieste for the, for the first three of these schools. And I have the numbers here, but I'm going to save them for a moment, for the moment. We also put together a white paper on the challenges uh, of becoming sustainable as a region. And here I want to, I've, I've written something which is kind of, I think it's, there's more to it than just what, what I've written down. Do you know that when there's a flood on the Tisa River, then the lead and the cadmium and the other heavy metals that have been sunken to the sediment will be re-emerging and you will have what is called legacy pollution. Do you know that there are several places along the Danube that cannot be used because of legacy pollution? I will, I will give you an example which is outside of the Danube region because I don't want to, to put shame on anybody. But when we went to the port of Montfalcone, during one of our interdisciplinary schools, we were told that they cannot enlarge the port because they cannot dig out the sediment there because it's so polluted. So what we th said, okay, any future for the Danube that is sustainable has to pay attention to the legacy, to the long term. And that's how we brought historians and other people from the humanities who are usually not thought of as being important for sustainability into this project. And then it became really, really, really successful in that some of those young people now are working for that future that we 
dreamt of about 10 years ago. Thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned the then your future interdisciplinary schools and uh, also the challenges, but also the, the successes that you um, have achieved with this. Can you tell us um, about the experience and cooperation that you have with these young people and also when you mentioned the sustainability aspect, um, what, what, is, what is happening today with them? Well, I think I now I'm going to read you a list of countries because I can't ever remember them. <laughs> we had 150 PhD students yeah. and recent postdocs right. and we brought them together and we asked them within a week, first you listen to the best of science and, and humanities that we can bring into these schools. We had teachers from all the Danube Rector's Conference uh, universities who came there on their own accord. They had to apply. So these were the people that really wanted to teach those young people something. And then they were mixed into teams. And they were mixed into teams of countries where recently there had not been any contact because they had on, been on different sides of wars. Mm -hmm. And we made them work together as teams for four days and they had to dream up a sustainability project. We had projects like building green artificial islands from plastic waste on the lower Danube where, there's, where there are no bridges. So the idea was to make these rivers livable and use plastic waste to build artificial island. I mean, that's, that's something that I think is one of the cool things. Yeah? They also, I can't go into all these, but it was 150 people from Albania, Austria, Bulgaria, Croatia, Czechia, Hungary, Italy, Romania, Serbia, Slovakia, Slovenia, and the Kosovo. And it was, I think it's, it showed that within a very, very short time, these people could decide on a theme together, on a project they wanted to develop. And what, what didn't happen was none of these projects was funded. We published them, but there was no funding for them, which, is the, which breaks my heart to some extent. But on the other hand, after three of these schools organized by the University of Trieste, in 2018, one of the graduates of the school, Svetelin Georgiev, organized a school in Ruse. Yeah, so it, so he, he switched from being a student to being a, a very, very important driving force. And in between Goran Gajski, who was also a graduate from our schools, he came when we had the, the Danube International School here in, in um, Krems, and he was a teacher here. So we, we made this transition for these young people from being taught to teaching and, and to from being participant in an initiative to being initiatives, to creating initiatives themselves. And I think that was a huge success. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, you know, Sebastian, but I think we should say that those two were also uh, the Nubius Young Scientists Award um, awardees. That, yeah. That's the perfect transition to the next thing. Thank you very much, Verena. Um, because we want to talk a little bit about fostering young researchers in the Danube region. And um, we have uh, actually not only the ones who participated in these schools, but there are also um, others that are involved now in the Danube Rectors Conference who are um, the Nubius Young Scientist Award winner. And uh, for this, um, I would uh, like to show you a little video. The Danube, more than just one of many European rivers. For me, a symbol of connectivity, cooperation and creation. It is the Danube that has connected me with many young people, colleagues from various fields of science. It is the Danube which was the inception of my cooperations both on the regional and international level with numerous experts from the countries of Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe. It is the Danube that creates my personal friendships and professional collaborations. I'm glad and honored to be a part of the Danubius Young Scientist Award community that already includes more than 100 promising researchers 
and which grows every year by 14 excellent representatives coming from countries that are part of the USDR. By fostering and promoting of the next generation within the Danube region and beyond, the Austrian Federal Ministry for Education, Science and Research, together with the Institute for the Danube region and Central Europe, IDM, remind us how crucial the cross-border, interdisciplinary and innovative approach in the world of science is. After all, the Danube represents the second largest river in Europe and, something I have learned, our ideas can be just as big. However, in order for them to grow, we need to let them, like in the case of the River Danube, flow through the minds of us all. I think this really deserves a round of applause. Let me tell you just a quick story about this. So Daniel um, is now working at IDM and also responsibility for the Danube Rectors Conference Permanent Secretariat, which I will come to in a second. But Daniel asked me in the um, preparation of this uh, Danube Salon um, one Friday, can I take the day off? And I said, well, okay, sure. And what he did on this one day, he put all of this together, cut it, um, produced it. So that was everything only done by Daniel. So that shows us that there are young aspiring researchers um, that can really work interdisciplinary because he's a trained historian um, and produced this video. And he's also here in the audience. So a big round of applause again. <laughs> So, but now, let's, let's come to the Danube Rectors Conference, who has been mentioned also a couple of times, and we are very happy that Sravko Kacic, the current president of the DRC, is here with us. Um, you are chairing a network of more than 60 universities by now in the Danube region. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how the DRC shapes the USDR? Yes, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me in, and giving me opportunity to this make a discussion about uh, uh, these issues which are very important for our region. And uh, we are very happy that the DRC is recognized as an, as an, I would say, official institution uh, or stakeholder within the Danube uh, strategy. Uh, <clears throat> we are talking about first 10 years of development of the Danube strategy. And of course, this can be a long period, but it can be also a short period and it depends on what are our goals and what are our objectives and we uh, are always uh, posing a question what have we done did we done enough are we engaged enough do we are, uh, do we have uh, uh, enough high awareness of the potential that danube as a region has within the europe what are the goals what is part within the europe as a uh, bigger picture i would say um, so the um, Danube Rectors Conference definitely is an active partner in uh, trying to uh, cover the important part of the activities needed to uh, build up the successful story of, uh, um, I would say, uh, reaching the objectives and goals of the Danube uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. However, I must admit that uh, at that point we are still on the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the uh, projects like Danube Future are very important because they pave the way on, uh, 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 to the, uh, uh, on the path where uh, we should build up an, um, an, uh, I would say a system where this, uh, such project will not be uh, dependent on a good will of some rectors, but would, would be something that will be recognized as a potential, as uh, uh, opportunity that uh, uh, DRC and of course the, all the universities that are engaged will contribute uh, by them on them best to, uh, um, I would say, 
make another stone in the puzzle of the successful story. Uh, so I would maybe uh, come to, to uh, um, or refer to the Bologna process. Uh, I see a lot of uh, parallels with what we are doing now in the uh, Danube region with uh, what uh, was done in Bologna process, which was much more politically supported, I would say, with, with much more money and uh, new uh, structures as it is uh, and, and was mentioned before, uh, with three no's, uh, which are advantages. I, I don't say this is something that is not uh, uh, good. I think it is a very good approach. Uh, but after the first 10 years, what we did in Bologna was just that we, in, I must admit, in many academic communities, uh, were, uh, um, uh, it was an opinion that this is not our project. This is political project. Politics started in Bologna. So it is not something that we should bother. But we were forced to actually change our study programs to introduce uh, uh, the, the, the common platform, I would say. And the, at the end of the first uh, decade, we were ready to actually start to make a Bologna uh, uh, story a success story. Then it comes Erasmus. And we all will admit that Erasmus is a success story. And now we have Erasmus Plus, which actually uh, goes another, uh, uh, makes another step. And within this second uh, decade, what happens was that we realized that this first decade was actually intended for establishing a common platform and the second uh, uh, decade is the decade in where we can actually uh, start to get get results. We have built our uh, built our uh, uh, actually um, uh, trust. We uh, recognize that the, the quality of the uh, education uh, uh, systems in all the countries are uh, comparable, so that the students can uh, actually. Uh, we uh, uh, go to any of the university and we will recognize them, their, their uh, notes. And this is something that c brings a lot of results and actually um, exploits the potentials that the Europe has in this area. And now we are going to the third decade, which is a, a, a new uh, actually phase with um, establishing uh, within the uh, uh, European University Initiatives and this uh, University Networks, a new, I would say, important steps that is uh, institutionalization of the European higher education area. That means we will build a new uh, um, institutions at the, end, at the 2030 called uh, European University. I know that we all know this, but I would like to stress that I see the similar uh, story within the Danube. So we are still at the point that we should raise the awareness about the Danube region as such, especially on national level, because as it was said in these flagship projects, many times we uh, 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 proposed an excellent uh, uh, proposals and I think there were some mentioned just right now, but at the end they were not accepted. Why not? Because at the national level something went wrong. And this is, uh, the, the, I think, the job that DRC has also to uh, um, pay full attention for the next decade, to actually raise the awareness of the uh, uh, Danube region as a region of uh, potential, as the region of opportunities, and actually, uh, um, I would say, integrate these ideas on the national level within the academic uh, uh, community and also in the politics. Mm -hmm. And I think because we are lacking this part, uh, a lot of initiatives actually don't uh, come to the success. Mm -hmm. And we hope that we will in the next uh, uh, um, decade try to improve uh, this and try to actually raise the awareness within the uh, university communities, within actually the second largest uh, rector conference in Europe mm -hmm. uh, to uh, exploit these opportunities and to show the, um, the potential that we have in this, especially on the uh, doctoral uh, studies and uh, in, in exploiting the uh, research infrastructure, connecting the researchers, supporting uh, maybe more actively good ideas and uh, uh, on national levels and, and European levels. So we have a lot to do and I see that there is 
if I can say so, a lot of space for improvement for the <laughs> next decade. <laughs> Thank you. Would you say that the inclusion of the DRC in the revised action plan of the USDR is the next step towards what you just uh, described? Yes, I would, uh, I would uh, um, go in this direction. So, so uh, we definitely should uh, play an active role in this and uh, show the potential that uh, the DRC as a, a, a network of many universities has uh, and actually to, uh, to, to make a space for uh, the activities that would uh, bring a, a high added value to any uh, um, national, actually, um, community where this um, will take place. Thank you very much. Before we go to the next question, we uh, will say goodbye to uh, President and Landesrat Eichtinger, who has, of course, another appointment within the framework of this forum. But thank you very much for being with us. Uh, so long, and once again, thank you very much for bringing us all together in the end here. And I would also like to use this quick break an opportunity to welcome a few more of our esteemed guests, Josef Edlinger, Anton Erber, and Christoph Kaufmann. Thank you very much for being with us. And I also see Otto Schwetz, in the audience. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, <laughs> before we come to the next topic, which will be culture, we want to ask you, the audience, again, a couple of um, questions via menti.com. So uh, please take out your smartphones. Um, type in the code 36841405 and answer the following question. How well does cultural cooperation in the region work? Very well, good enough. There's room for improvement or not well. The live stream has our 15 second delay. This is the reason why we already could see results maybe before you could uh, start to type in your answers. But we see that 50% think there's room for improvement, which is, of course, always a possibility. But there are things that are, are working well. Um, as well, and uh, Katka Krejcová. Low Austria is a very strong region, as we have learned, both within Austria, but also in Europe. And in many aspects, it represents the best practice that it could inspire other European regions. What are EU cooperation programs or projects that target the regional levels that you are experiencing in your daily work, um, perhaps also within the USDR? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, as the Mr. Eichtinger has already uh, mentioned, uh, the traditional role uh, of Lower Austria as a bridge builder uh, in uh, Europe of region is last but not least due uh, to the geographical location but also to s very strong historical issues. So. Uh, the length of the external border of Lower Austria, it's over 400 kilometers, and the Danube flows through Lower Austria for almost 300 kilometers. So the Danube and the borders shape Lower Austria in many ways, and but it connects them, uh, Lower Austria, also with uh, the neighbor regions, but to all Danube regions. So uh, these facts had been reflected uh, in the establishment of the Arge Donauländer uh, uh, in the working community of the Danube region, uh, which is a still very important platform for uh, 
exchange on the level of regions. Uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain uh, moved Lower Austria from the edge of the European Union to its heart and to its center. So since then, uh, cross-border cooperation and inter-regional cooperation became even more a kind of conditio sine qua non and a very central and integral part of Lower Austrian policy. So, of course, uh, Lower Austria benefits a lot from three cross-border interreg programs. Uh, these programs provide in the new funding period about more than 40 million euros. And uh, we have very reliable partners in our neighbor regions. So uh, this is for sure the most uh, important tool and, and uh, funding tool for our cross-border and inter-regional cooperation. Uh, but they are not only the cross-border interreg programs. Uh, we uh, use very much the Danube Transnational Program, which uh, provides the possibility to build a great and uh, really uh, big networks all over of the whole Danube region. So, and if I compare uh, this interreg programs three decades back and now. So these programs became kind of demanding, the projects became uh, more complex, but the partnerships we have built over the three decades are very reliable and even our partners and network partners and project partners uh, became also kind of friends. So, <laughs> we great. have a very great experience with, mm -hmm. with interreg programs, of course. And uh, in the meantime, uh, they help to, uh, to provide a very good infrastructure in the border region. So, these interreg programs, they helped to transform the former border region kind of no man's land into connecting lines where people meet each other and where, uh, which are connecting lines uh, for contact to the neighbor regions mm -hmm. and to the partners mm -hmm. in the neighbor regions. You are also in this aspect dealing with culture a lot and uh, culture is of course an asp aspect that brings people together. Um, and we create bridges between people from different parts of the European continent. What role of culture within the cooperation on the regional level and what function do EU policies have for the European cultural integration? Well, uh, culture, in my opinion, uh, culture has definitely the power to build bridges uh, and because it is a never-ending source of empathy and dialogue. Uh, art and culture uh, not only affect our intellect, but they touch our hearts and our souls. Uh, they deal with ourselves, our identity, with the others, with their identity. And uh, sometimes they provide new impetus for opinions and they definitely uh, eliminate uh, any kind of prejudice. So this is a very important uh, role of an impact of culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want uh, to connect countries and regions, you definitely have to connect people first. And uh, this is the best way to do it, just through art and culture. So cultural cooperations have definitely uh, diplomatic power and uh, are a very uh, integral part of foreign policies and uh, for the European cohesion process. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kaska. Robert Lichtner, 
a lot has been achieved over the past 10 years. We've heard a lot. We have uh, heard that, for instance, also with Ukraine, for the first time, a non-EU member country will take over um, the USDR. The Danube strategy point that you are responsible for is certainly a milestone in these past 10 years. What are things that have been achieved that you are proud of, but where do you also see maybe shortcomings? Thank you for the question. Um, uh, we heard a lot about uh, cooperation already, and I think every one of the speakers today spoke about the importance of the cooperation. And I think this is not just a profound word that you just say, cooperation. I think this is within the USDR, and we speak about 10 plus years uh, that we have been cooperating. And we have 14 countries, we have 14 states, we have 115 million people in this region, and we have the governments who came together 10 years ago and decided to cooperate together. And maybe I would like to take it from the other side. Um, uh, the, the, the idea behind the uh, um, um, transnational cooperation is quite, is quite a different approach. When you look on the, on the national levels and then you have to elevate and look at a real macro-regional transnational cooperation. And this is, this is actually the idea that we, that we work on within, within the strategy. So when we speak about um, problems, when we speak about the grand challenges that we, that we, that we look at, and, and as we heard, these, these problems, when we speak about um, ecological problem, problems, we speak about the uh, um, crisis, uh, um, a financial crisis, we speak about uh, pollution, uh, sustainable development, when we speak about um, green and blue economy, this is all problems or challenges that uh, cannot be done by single states. So this is the idea behind it, that we have 14 countries within the, within the um, uh, Danube strategy that came together and worked together on solving these problems. So I think this is, this is one of the big achievements uh, that we have done. Uh, throughout the, the past 10 years, and we heard already uh, a lot about this. Um, and um, uh, with, with these problems that the, the countries try to, to solve together, I think this is, this is the added value on the national level, but also on the transnational level. So uh, this the cooperation is definitely one of the key issues here, and, 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 and if we speak about uh, 10 years, is it a lot or is it not a lot? I mean, uh, we heard already, and I'm completely with you with the, with the Rector's Conference, 10 years is actually not a lot. So we are basically right at the beginning, and, and this policy coordination really needs time. But in the, in the past 10 years, a lot of ha has been achieved, and um, uh, thank you for the question, and, and we heard this already, uh, that, that the cooperation not only goes within the countries of the EU, but uh, countries that are not members of the European Union. And this is one of, the, one of the key focuses that we have also to support and to help our neighbors, be it the Western Balkan countries or the, Eastern, uh, the countries of the Eastern Partnership. Within the strategy, we work on the same grounds. So it makes no difference if, this is, uh, if, if that's Ukraine or if it's Germany. It's, uh, the, 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 the strategy works for everyone the same. And I think this is also one of the achievements um, that we have. And uh, with 2022, uh, we have Ukraine as the first non-EU member state taking over the presidency, which is, uh, as already mentioned, quite a, quite a leap, and, and, and I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, and, and also, with, uh, with the maturing of, a, of, of something as a, as a macro-regional strategy, you do need uh, stable structures. So uh, within the governance, and we heard this, we have 14 member states, 14 representatives, uh, of the national states who uh, basically decide on what happens. But on the other hand, uh, we have the so-called thematic coordinators. So all these topics that we're talking about, uh, be it uh, transport, be it mobility, um, uh, be it sustainable development, and uh, en energy, tourism, uh, security, they are being co coordinated by, tech by, by technical and by, by other experts. So we have this multi-level governance as well. And this is something that really needs time and needs stable structures. And um, uh, I think it was, it was a really good step, as we heard um, before already, to establish a secretariat to have a permanent structure for the strategy, which is, which is here to help the stakeholders 
and um, the Danube Strategy Point has been has been working since 2018. We are a uh, partnership of the of the two funding countries, so we have uh, also a nice narrative here: uh, Romania and Austria. Uh, Austria having uh, the lead, so we have uh, two uh, uh, cities: we have Vienna and we have Bucharest, where we work from which is um, everything else and easy when you don't see your colleagues on the other side <laughs> physically. I mean, we all get used to it by now uh, with, with Corona, but we had that experience even before. Um, so the Danube strategy point is, uh, uh, as I said, um, I'm supporting the strategy, all the actors. Uh, we are working also on the capacity building for the actors, for the core actors, and also for the non-EU member states, for the colleagues from, uh, uh, from the five non-EU member states. Uh, one of the most important things is, and, and we heard this, it's, it's, it's all about implementation, it's also about the projects, about what happens on the ground. And uh, we try also here um, to help with the funding, with the alignment of the strategy towards the funds, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the policy coordination needs the projects, so you need to have concrete results at the end of the day. Um, we also have the communication, so uh, trying to promote the strategy itself and the achievements and the goals. And um, last but not least, monitoring and evaluation. And this is also where the strategy should head uh, in the future. So looking at what was, what was achieved and uh, what could and what can be done mm -hmm. uh, in the future. Thank you very much. I would like to use this as the l last uh, question for, for this round, um, looking into the future. When um, we want to support the prosperity um, of the people living in the region, or to use the words from the slogan that we've seen in a couple of these videos, to remain a unique region where life loves to live, what does the USDR need to do in the next 10 years? Still a lot. We have done a lot, but there is still a lot to do. Um, I think we, and we heard this before, and, and, uh, and uh, I would like to repeat it, it's about the commitment. It's about the commitment of the states, of the member states, because the strategy is owned by the 14 member states. So as, as much the member states show their engagement, as much as they are committed to the strategy, the more and the better results we will have. So I think we need to uh, stay committed, each and every stakeholder that works within the strategy, and um, I would like to return to the question of the of, of funding, and we heard that, that that also based with the three no's, and I think and I think uh, that uh, it is it is a it is a negative, but also it has a positive, because uh, and I completely agree with you uh, that by uh, not having an own funds, it also makes the strategy agile, so you are really capable to adapt quicker. And what we, what we are doing for the, for the next funding period, so we talk, we're talking about 21-27 um, period, uh, and we already heard that there is a new action plan. So the new action plan was already prepared, the revised action plan was already prepared and aligned uh, with the five policy objectives of the, of the European Union. So basically on the content side, we are already as a strategy set on the 21-27 uh, funding period. What we are doing now is to try to secure jointly with all the stakeholders the funding on the national and on the regional programs. So when we have the operational programs, and we know there is, there is uh, uh, one, of the, one of the goals here is to uh, align the funding. So to achieve a real macro-regional cooperation, you need to have uh, more countries, national operational programs, being aware that certain topics, we call them uh, strategic topics or flagships, uh, uh, as we call it, are here. And within this transnational cooperation, you make it possible to have funding for certain topics in several states at once. So uh, this is, this is the, the exercise that we are going through now. And uh, it's about uh, discussion, it's about uh, cooperation and coordination from the strategy level and from the programming level. And again, to return to the, to the uh, cooperation on equal grounds, this is not only about the member states, but equally uh, looking at the, at the um, uh, pre-accession instruments and also on the neighborhood instruments. So also uh, making sure that the projects and the outcomes 
are able to be financed also in the in the neighboring countries. So uh, uh, the process we call embedding. So embedding is one of the one of the key points uh, that uh, that the strategy has been working on for now. And uh, from 2022, we will be going into the implementation phase. So 22 plus, we will see hopefully the first good results for um, for the for the strategy itself. Uh, just three three more topics I would like to mention, and this this we heard of this already. Um, uh, this is the European Green Deal, so this is one of the most important topics that the strategy is very much aware of, and this is also about aligning the policies and aligning the funding. So speaking about uh, European Green Deal, digital transformation, and of course post-COVID recovery. So uh, these three topics are uh, very, very important and are the key topics at the moment and will probably uh, be with us for the, for the next uh, at least five years. So, um, yeah, I would stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, we have heard a lot today and uh, I think we have gotten a, a, a very good overview about the EUSDR. And uh, as, a, as a final question, I would pose it again to the audience, um, be they are physically in this room or in front of your devices. And we would uh, like to one last time ask you to connect to menti.com, type in the code and answer the question. Based on the discussion today, what will be the most important achievement of the EUSDR in 2031? Sustainable growth in the whole region, 100% CO2 free mobility, strengthening the regions and cities, Western Balkan states becoming a new member, environmental protection, less strategy, more projects, peace in Europe, born by good chances for all citizens, peace again, bringing the EU closer to its European partners, political commitment in the EUSDR, more regional cooperation in the Danube region. I think these are all very good um, points that we should take into consideration. Um, I'll have the chance for a very, very brief last statement on the um, important achievements for 2031. Verena, what would you say most important achievement for the USDR, if possible, in one word? Environment and peace is one goal. Wonderful, Strafko. Uh, connected uh, project with uh, within the uh, DRC community, and especially bringing uh, uh, high added value to the society. Thank you, Katka. Um, uh, absolutely, from the cultural side, uh, awareness of our cultural identity, of our common cultural values and cultural diversity. And uh, yes, peace, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Robert. Well, e EUSDR, um, uh, prosperity through diversity, where no region gets left behind. Thank you very much again for a wonderful panel. Um, Verena Vinivata, Stravko Kacic, Katka Krejcova, and Robert Lichtner. Thank you very much for being with us today. Yes, and that already brings this Danube Salon to an end. I enjoyed it very much to see live people again. As I said in the beginning, it was great to discuss with people in real life again. I hope we can do that much more often. Um, we've heard a lot about the USDR. There are lots of things that have been mentioned. Um, as I said, this will be available afterwards on, for instance, the IDM YouTube channel where you can revisit what has been um, said today. Um, also rewatch some of the uh, predictions for 2031. I, from my side, hope that we will not need 
10 years until we can meet again to discuss about these topics. I would be very happy um, to uh, continue this very, very soon in whichever format. And last but not least, I would like to say thank you to each and every cooperation partner that made uh, this here possible. We actually started to talk about that a little bit less than two years ago. And uh, finally, it came into being. I'm very happy and I'm very glad that we could cooperate with the AG Donauländer, Simon Ortner, but also Teresa Stummer. Of course, with the Secretary General of the Europa Forum Wachau, Teresa Edstadler and the whole IDM team that has been supporting this in the back, but also the ones that are never mentioned because they make everything running so smoothly and tell me um, to cut it short because we are already over time. Thank you very much for all your support. And um, to end on a connected note, which was probably the most used buzzword today, we will listen to the European Anthem. Mm -hmm.